Welcome to Funders in Conversation. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, I am joined on stage by a fabulous panel who I will really quickly introduce, even though their names are huge behind my head. Um, Ros Karlik is the ex Chief Executive of the Heritage Lottery Fund. Caroline Mason is the Chief Executive of the Esme Fairburn Foundation. Maurice Sinclair is the Chief Executive of the Paul Hammond Foundation. And Stephen Juker is the Director of the Art Fund. Um, so the structure today is that each of the panellists are going to talk a little bit about their organisations individually, then we're going to have a bit of a group discussion, but I'm going to try and leave like 20 minutes for questions, uh, so it is all on you. We were talking beforehand, and what these guys want is for you to, I mean, not have a go at them, but <laughs> be more honest than you might otherwise. Uh, so if not a safe space, we're going to try at least be an amnesty. No individual pitches. Um, <laughs> I don't want you to give us your name and say where you're from because, you know, maybe say something that you might not necessarily want to be on your record. Ask, this, is, this, is where you can, this is where you can ask the difficult questions, uh, so, so please do. Um, so, uh, Ross, uh, speaking of tricky questions, I thought we... <laughs> it's not that tricky, honestly. Um, I thought we could sort of start by talking about that tricky heritage word. Um, and, and, how you, and how you as an organisation deal with that and maybe how you're trying to redefine maybe what the public understanding of heritage might be a little bit through your work. Yeah, I mean, I think it's really interesting, isn't it? I th to me, I've, I've been at Heritage Lottery now for about 15 months and I discovered pretty early on that one of my very wise predecessors had made a decision never to define heritage. And I think that was one of the cleverest things that the Heritage Lottery ever did. Because if you've never defined heritage, you never have to redefine heritage. <laughs> so we never have to go back and say, oh, does it have to be pre-Victorian? Does it have to be this? Does it have to be that? We say to people, come and tell us why this thing that you, what you want to do something with is important to you. Come and tell us about why it's your heritage. And we don't mind if it's part of your recent heritage, whether it's past really far distant. We don't mind if it's physical. We don't mind if it's intangible. We just want to hear about why it's really, really important to you. And what we also want to hear is how that fits within the sort of wider story of what you're trying, you know, what you're trying to do with your organisation, what story you want to tell, and what is it going to do for people and communities? And this is the bit that I think museums increasingly get, but I have to say I don't think every sector gets. It isn't just about the thing, whatever the thing might be, that you care about really passionately. And with heritage, people do care really, really passionately about things. It is about what is that actually going to deliver for people and communities, because we feel really strongly. We get our funding, as you probably realise from the National Lottery, there'd be amazed number of people who don't realise, despite having Heritage Lottery in, in the name. Um, and we get 20% of the money, and it's literally 20% of how many tickets were bought last month. So it's really important to us that people feel that, that they get value back for the investment, if you like, that they're making through the Good Causes funding. And actually, Jenny didn't say I couldn't make a pitch, so I'm going to make a very quick pitch which is that we have um, a special event coming up in the uh, week commencing the 11th of December, where we're asking everybody who's had lottery funding, and particularly heritage from us, Heritage Lottery, obviously, but all the lottery funders do, to do something to say thanks to you to lottery players. So if you go on our website, you'll see all about it, and it's still time to sign up. But I think it's really, really important to us that we can get that message back to people and that they can really understand where it comes from. And frankly, it is... you know. Times are challenging. You know, we were just chatting before we came in about what's the biggest problem you've got at the moment. And I think the biggest problem for us is we can't fund all the really good projects that are coming to us. They're just the, the demand for our funding is greater and greater and greater. Other types of funding is dropping away. So now you know you used to have a good pro you have to have a good project, and then you had to have a great project, and now I think you have to have a fantastic project, and you have to be really, really clear about it, and you have to know what it's going to deliver. And that is quite challenging for us, because it does mean that we can't fund things, even though they might have come back to us three times, having tried to take into account the points that we've raised with them, because there's still better projects there on the table that people are asking for funding for. So I, I think it's, you know, for you as organisations who are thinking about applying to, to HLF, I would really urge you to put that thinking in at the beginning and not launch into the process until you've really thought it through. Mm -hmm. So you're already, you're already getting kitchen tips. 
It's <laughs> worth, worth the admission price alone. Um, Caroline, we, whenever we s spoke bef before today, and, and what it might be interesting to sort of uh, weigh in for you talking about the work that you do, is something around you know placemaking and community and the r role that museums play in that, which it turns out has been a thing that's been talked about quite a lot at conference, so obviously relevant. I just wanted to echo Roz to say that um, art, heritage, culture, um, it's, for us going forward, it has to be grounded in something more than just the organisation and the building um, or the organisation and um, the, the project or the programme. Um, and so, I mean, I'm not going to go through the sort of um, our priorities because they're pretty clear on our website and happy to talk to people afterwards about that. But um, I suppose over and above, as you say, what is fantastic for us um, over and above a kind of, yes, these are the, these are the sort of must-haves, um, are um, this idea that, and we call them unusual alliances or unusual partnerships, where um, the work that you do is contributing to something more than just your work. So whether that's how you, how you fit into a place um, it's how you uh, work with other organisations doing similar things around the country um, on, for example, a, a new way of working. Um, it might be about how you're using um, different funding mechanisms. So, for example, we do quite a lot of social investment in the arts. Or, um, so how are you leveraging your, your assets, um, but not just for you, but to do more then. Um, and then finally, um, as I said earlier, you know, um, how are you linking with other issue areas which are becoming really critical? So, for example, the environment. Um, I was really struck by the, you know, it is, it is the issue of our times. Um, and um, so where in, all the, where in all the work is there that, that understanding that this is fundamentally critical to to our future and how could you creatively use your, your, your position and your place and your work to start bringing some of these issues more to life. Um, so that those are the sorts of things that we see is what takes something from good, great to absolutely fantastic. Excellent, good. Um, Stephen, um, when I think there's a, often, I think people, I mean, in total fairness, maybe not people in the museum world, but people in the public world think that if they know about the art fund, they think that what you do is help people buy titians that might be about to leave the country. <laughs> um, so I thought it might be interesting to talk about, you know, how, you, you know, do you see that you're expanding the remit of what the art fund do? Is that a conscious thing that you're doing as an organisation? And also maybe a little bit about your attitude to collections, which is a big theme at the conference. And, um, we you wield your influence in that area? Yes, we do, we do sometimes help with Titians um, <laughs> and helping museums acquire works of art, which is what we've been doing since we were founded in 1903, still is a very central objective that we have. And it accounts for probably something like 75% of our grant giving. Um, but we are changing. And I think like most of my colleagues here, we as an organisation are trying to balance the things that we have already decided we want to do in the world mm -hmm. uh, against the things that people are asking us now to consider doing as, the, as that world around us changes. Mm -hmm. And I think that sort of struggle between, if you like, the, the proactive side of grant giving and the reactive side is something that we're keenly feeling. Um, we've already started to expand into new areas of grant giving, and I hope in your delegate packs you've received a... Um, a booklet outlining essentially all the grant giving streams that we are running in the current year and, and in, in the year ahead. Um, we're setting an ambition actually to increase our grant giving in, in cash terms um, by about uh, 30 to 40 percent over the next three years, which is going to entail a lot of extra fundraising, but mm -hmm. that's kind of what we do. Every pound that we give away, we also have to raise from someone else. Um, and by the way, since Ros had a quick pitch, my pitch is, please join the Art Fund. You just have to buy one of our new brilliant curator's art passes, sold at a fraction of the... Have you uh, not brought one on stage? <laughs> ...of the market price. Um, it's really important that we get 
community support behind us. That's really what the Art Fund is about. It's about mobilising people en masse behind things that we believe matter to the country. And at the moment, we have 123,000 members, people who go to museums. We have hardly any museum members. You don't need the National Art Pass, I know, <laughs> to get discounts to go into museums, but you do need to help us, and we will help you in return. If you do, and our other fundraising is successful, our grant giving will go up to about 10 million a year by 2020 and that means not just more money for acquisitions it means more money for curatorial training for exhibitions displays uh, and so on and partnerships above all else which i suspect is something we're all going to find ourselves talking about in the next half hour or so are a critical part of the future you know none of us is going to succeed uh, if we're not working both with each other and also closely with you um, to meet your objectives Mm -hmm. So you mean partnerships with you and, you know, museums, rather than museums partnering together and bringing well, a thing to you? Well, I think, I mean, there is a traditional assumption that, you know, we are the munificent givers of funds and, and mm -hmm. everyone else is the grateful recipients mm -hmm. of those. But in fact, we are, we all have our own objectives. Yeah. Our institutions all have quite big egos, actually. And I think there's a real danger... Pretend to be surprised. To that be surprised. We, there's a danger that we forget that in order to fulfil our objectives, we need great projects, we need great yeah. institutions, and so we are actually grateful when we find people doing really terrific, innovative yeah. work that matches some of the things that we believe are important as well. So it is a partnership, it's not just yeah. a giving and a receiving, mm -hmm. I think. Yeah, excellent. Um, Moira? Yeah. We <laughs> It's a cautious look. Um, we, we had a conversation that was a, about audiences, and you said a thing that I thought was really interesting, which was that you said, you know, it used to be about numbers, but it's not about numbers for us anymore. It's about, like, depth and quality. Mm. Yeah. So I thought it might be nice to speak a bit about like that in terms of your agenda as an organisation. Yeah, I, th I think that's... I, I stand by that. I was right when I talked to you, and I, I feel yeah. right now. Um, <coughs> uh, Paul Hamlin, who set up our foundation, was... Uh, a migrant. He came across from Germany in 1939, just before the outbreak of the Second World War, and established his home here and started his business selling books off a, a barrow stand in, in Camden. And uh, the foundation is built on the values that he espoused and in giving back his money to set the organisation up. Um, we now talk a lot about access to and participation in arts and culture um, because he felt that was really important. He was incredibly grateful to this country for the chance it gave him. And he uh, made his fortune selling books to people, selling music to people, bringing pleasure to people's lives. And we're particularly interested in people who are experiencing disadvantage in one way or another. So Stephen's point is, is well made, that actually we, we have quite clearly established places that we want to go with our funding. We want people to um, realise their potential. We want them to lead creative and fulfilling lives. We also know that we don't do that. It's the organisations that we fund that are absolutely critical to that piece. And I think there has been a shift away from purely numbers <coughs> to saying we're interested in the quality and depth of that engagement. and We want to help you work out um, what's working in that space and to build on that. To, to create the evidence and database, not for us. We don't need you to report back to us, but actually so that you can use that information to inform your own practice and to develop programmes and continue programmes that are really working. The other thing I'd say is that we've, we're distinctly um, working with two types of funding now. So we are in the privileged position of being able to help people explore and test new ideas, which I think is one of the great joys of being in an independent foundation. Um, we're somebody handed me my badge, the failure badge, and said, would you like to go into this booth and talk about failure? Which I will do after this, probably not <laughs> beforehand. Um, but, but as a funder, we're quite comfortable with the idea that if we want to see continuous improvement, if we want to see people achieving their very best, then not everything will work. And we, there's a specific way of funding which says if you want a small amount of money to test something, to, to take it from you know, very early stage to the next stage, you can come and talk to us about that and we'd be delighted to learn alongside you. Similarly, there's more funding available for something called more and better. So if you're doing something that's working and you want to scale it and expand it or share it with other people, um, we're the people to come and talk to about that. Mm -hmm. uh, but 
um, the things that really get me excited are when I can see that people's lives are being changed. And all of you will have those experiences as well. And sometimes the work that we fund touches the lives of 20 or 30 people. Um, and the learning, we hope, will touch the lives of 200 or 2,000 people. But the, the actual impact and experience in that project in that moment is quite small, but the depth of it is really um, wonderful. Excellent. Good. Lovely. Um, so, so, yeah, let's move into the kind of group when hopefully I'm not going to talk very much and you guys are going to just interrupt each other and sling your thoughts around, which I think would be lovely. Um, I thought it might be interesting to talk about sort of issues around equality of funding across the UK <coughs> and how you feed into that and where you think the priorities are there. Well, shall I kick off? I mean, I think we, because we are a UK-wide funder and we're, we're sort of one of the relatively few distributors that, that does work across the UK now, we work incredibly hard to make sure that our funding is spread across... Um, the UK in a sort of fair way um, and you can define what fair is and not all the lottery distributors actually define it in the same way. We define it on a technically per capita basis and then we have national programmes that people can apply into which then means that if you happen to be, if you like Scotland and you have you know, um, relatively small population compared to your land mass, you know, you have an opportunity to apply and perhaps for landscape funding and things like that. So it, it gives you an opportunity to look at those two things. I do think that we have um, a real challenge, even amongst, we, we, you know, we look at it really carefully and we feel quite smug and we think, oh yes, we've got it spread and you look at a map and it all looks, but actually you will still find within that pockets of areas that are not getting funding and that we're not getting to. And we're starting to think much more about, well, how do we make sure not just that you know, we're doing a lovely geographic spread, but that we're getting to as wide a range of people and as many different organisations as we possibly can. In fact, just last weekend, some of the team went off to do um, a, a sort of test project on micro grants in Barrow and Furness, just to see whether actually, if we, if we got our funding, if we made our funding more accessible by saying, actually, just turn up, you know, come and see me today, tell me what you want to do, and we can give you an instant decision on whether you can get funding mm -hmm. for it whether we could start to get people who find the thought of a website and the thought of going on and doing something mm. in that sort of way, whether we could sort of get... And, we, and we, it was pretty successful, and it was a really, really interesting yeah. thing to do. And we're testing one or two things like that. I think, I think testing and finding new solutions absolutely is what we have to be doing yeah. right now. Yeah, and sometimes when you're, when you're in, you know, a particular world, you think writing a bid is a fairly obvious thing you know the grammar and structure of writing a bid but if mm. you're doing it for the first time like it's mm. terrifying i mean you know. we find that i think something like 80 percent of our grants numerically go outside london mm -hmm. go across across the uk but only about 50 percent of the money goes outside london yeah. so in other words we are despite our best <coughs> efforts london centric mm -hmm. and i think in the in the in the museum sphere, I mean, I mean, I'm talking, I suppose, particularly from the perspective of acquisitions, but other kinds of specialist activity, I think there is a, a growing uh, desirability of the London-based institutions, obviously, particularly the national museums, to work more creatively and generously mm -hmm. with museums around the country. And none of us has yet mentioned the M word, the Mendoza. Uh, <laughs> no, but, but I've really been trying to think of a way. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, that one of the things that enjoins national museums to mm. do is to, is to take on national responsibilities. And I mm -hmm. think I, I do, you know, see a, a great future actually for real sharing of knowledge and, and, and expertise and, and resource ultimately, and human resource but perhaps financial resource, so we become less concerned about this uh, sense of kind of neatly covering every corner of the, of the mm -hmm. country on the map, but what we're ensuring through digital and other means is a, a constant flow of exchange and communication. And I think there are some really good examples in the art sector of where national organisations are doing uh, that in a way that feels generous and respectful and um, in, in true partnership as opposed to a model of sort of 
Being dinosaurs period. clumping yeah, yeah, into yeah, town yeah, and yeah. then disappearing back out again. So I'd point at um, the, the Royal Shakespeare Company's Learning Performance Network, mm. which connects the Royal Shakespeare Company to local theatres mm. and through local theatres to schools and teachers in a, a really interesting networked way, which is making a, a best use of everyone's resources, local connections, mm. um, fantastic writers, and the brand and reach that the RSC can have as well at a UK-wide level. And I think there are interesting models that one could point to. I think, I think also it comes, I think for us we're looking at, we're, we're very conscious that this also links to our position and the whole power dynamic actually. Mm. And um, it's very hard to be a good national, a UK wide funder when you're in an office at King's Cross actually. Um, and so this, the things that we do is, for example, we have a great relationship. We, we, we do quite a lot of delegated funding um, and obviously the Museums Association relationship, which we've had for 10 years, is a really good example of that, where actually we're not the experts, and so how can we use our money to facilitate experts um, and work with them, and we learn from that, and, um, you know, and we are able, I think, to um, allocate money in a much, much, much more effective and better way. Um, so, you know, we've, we've funded 72 organisations in the last 10 years um, with sort of £5 million. Pounds. We've got another 3.5 million <coughs> over the next couple of years through the Mu Museums Association Collections Fund. So that's one way. Um, the other way um, is, for example, we partner, maybe not in the arts and heritage space, but we um, work with people like the Lloyds Foundation in Scotland because we're not going to know what good looks like in Scotland. So how do we work with them um, and then finally in our in our place-led work we are we've a, we're actually um, delegating quite significant amounts of money so a million pounds at a time down to local communities where we're not actually involved in the decision making at all um, and we're not quite sure how that's going to work to be honest um, but there is something about us not being the ones deciding what good looks like um, and I think that that's a real challenge for us to, and we do it sometimes well and sometimes, for example, the Music Association is where we've done that well. Um, and in the place-led stuff, it's where we're learning very, very fast on our feet, actually. Can I just say that I think um, the world has changed quite a lot and those organisations which we might call backbone organisations mm. seem to us to be quite important in a, a world where local government funding is being cut and, and uh, central government funding is actually being mm. cut too. And so the museums association type organisations mm. or um, the Cultural yeah. Learning Alliance or others yeah. who are speaking up on behalf of the sector so that we support, um, providing training yeah. which uh, the sectors are identifying as really critical um, Kind of having an advocacy role mm. those organizations we're helping to fund as well because yeah. we don't see other people who are stepping into that space and we think once they're gone we will miss them more than we can possibly say and if it means a bit of core funding at this stage to enable those organizations to come through this period and re reconstitute their models in some way that seems to us to be pretty yeah. critical in the mix yeah i think it's a really important point that um even even if we sort of rethought our approach to additionality, which we are, are encouraged to do by the M report, um, we would uh, we couldn't fill all the you know really genuine and important gaps that I know people in this room and others have got in terms of their funding. So I think for many of us, trying to think about how we can best help people to find solutions yeah. is the way that we have to go. We've we've done some. Um, really helpful work around uh, looking at, at parks and how they operate. Many of the same challenges, mm. actually quite interesting thing, mm. when you cover a wide range of yeah. sectors as we do, you see the same challenges coming up in different areas. And some of that work has been about saying, let's try some things, and actually some of them didn't work. Yeah. But I think it's just as useful for other people to look at a, a piece of work that went on to say, well, we tried this, you know, we tried doing a business improvement district just for parks. And actually, you know, that proved to be a struggle. We tried one or two other different models. Some of them were great, some of them weren't. Some of them we didn't take as far as we wanted to. And we're now taking that piece of work one step further with something called Rethinking Parks too. And I think that sort of strategic work that helps people to think about um, 
what the solutions might be is something that we should be involved in. And I th actually, the one, the one overwhelming conclusion that came from that, which I suspect would be exactly the same if we repeated the thing from museums, is that there is not a single answer, mm. which is not what people want to hear. They want to hear that there was some magic bullet that came mm. out at the end that would work for everybody. It didn't. That every, every area, every particular facility, or whatever it is that you're trying to deal with, had to look at its own particular circumstances, the political dynamic, the demographics, all of those issues, and see which of the solutions might work. But I think at least with them, we're helping people to do some of that thinking and supported by the resilience funding that we offer organisations to look at themselves and how they operate. Hopefully, we'll help them to find a way forward. I mean, another example, I mean, I think you're right about the London-based. I mean, our, our funding into London has been cut dramatically and our funding outside of London has increased. And even where we fund in London, we would only fund things like Battersea Arts that are actually in the collaborative touring network, which is building, um, which is helping to build capacity in places where there is none in a really creative way. I mean, it's extraordinary. How, how that's led to organisations being created in areas where there were none and getting NPO status, for example. So th those are the types of um, London-based, that's the only type of London-based work that we really will, f will fund now. It almost sounds like you're, you want to get involved earlier in the process. So, so rather than people go away and come up with an idea and bring it to you, you're just like, we want to help you do the work to come up with new ideas and come up with new strategies. You know, lots of the obvious stuff has been done and now people are having to try and work in a new way and find new solutions to the sort of difficult times that we're living in. And people need a bit of support for that. It's like, a, you know, yeah. that we, and we, we were sort of talking before we came on stage about, you know, change and that often you guys are in the position of telling organisations that they have to, you know, there's, and this is the M, the M review, um, you know, there's not going to be any more money. So uh, you can keep on saying that you need more money, but like that's not going to help. Uh, and, mm. you know, change isn't just aspirational, change is also survival. And, and, and you know, that sometimes you have a slightly therapeutic role in trying to help people get there because it's, it's hard to do things differently whenever you feel under attack and you feel scared. And I think that's why the Mendoza Review was focusing very much upon taking the resources that we've got and making them work better and thinking more strategically about how we can help. And I, I think that really is an important message. It sounds sort of obvious, but I think we do need to do that better. We need to think about how... I mean, it was interesting for us, actually, the report, because it, we analyse our funding across all of heritage. We don't distinguish between museums and other types of heritage. It is, mm. for us, it is a single entity when we analyse across the UK. So actually, when the main desert came back in the analysis, they just said to us, well, actually, you know, you're giving more money to museums in London. Well, we'd never thought about how we split our funding mm. for museums. That was not an analysis we did. And we certainly hadn't thought about splitting our funding for museums in England, because again, not analysis that we did. And not surprisingly, because of the preponderance of the nationals in London, mm. mm -hmm. if you look at England, it was true. It actually was becoming less and less true, but it was true that there was more funding going into, into London. And I think that's a huge dilemma. And I said that's, that's why the report probably said we need to make sure we get value. Because you know, we want world leading museums. We have to have that, not just in London, but in all our major cities. And I think what we, what we must therefore say is, you know, you deserve the funding to be a world leading museum. We want you to stay in that position, but you have to, you have to spread, you have to work with others. You have to make that funding work harder. You have to think about whether that exhibition could tour somewhere else, could be mm. important somewhere else, because otherwise it becomes increasingly hard for us as funders mm. to justify why we put that funding into those museums. I mean, you know, the landscape ahead is scary. You mm. know, there are some huge uncertainty we're all facing um, and I think you know history does suggest that it's in times of scary times and times of scarcity of resource that sometimes you get the most ingenious mm -hmm. kinds of thinking <laughs> and you know in the museum world I mean if you were a Martian landing in the UK today you wouldn't <laughs> believe that there were all these different museums with all their boards of trustees and local authorities I mean mm -hmm. there are different ways of organizing the presentation of you know, museum collections and stories mm. uh, uh, and ideas. Uh, there is huge scope still for collaboration and new kinds of 
amalgamation and partnership. You know, I'm not going to get into deaccessioning, but mm. you know, there Ooh, are lots of things. <laughs> that, and I think this is, you know, we've reached the moment in time when thinking daringly is, is the way forward. The money has run out to do things in the way we've always done them. Mm. I think that's, that's yeah, the exactly. Time. It's not. Yeah. So I think, you know, funders think... are going to respond to. To, to radical ideas. I think, you're, I think you're right, and I think Caroline's right. It's very easy for us to sound pompous. Mm. And actually, all three of us are in King's Cross, which is, you know, in terms of diversity <laughs> and reach, is really shocking. I live in Belfast, uh, for the record. Uh, <laughs> um, and, and so we as funders have to think about how we change our operational mm. style as well to respond to that world. Um, I think there's a duty on us to think about how we share our knowledge and learning yeah, and we yeah, do have it because we have the ability to scan across in a way that it's quite mm. hard to do when you're running your individual institution in a particular town. And it, it, we've got the information, we ask it of people like you and then we, you know, what do we do with it? Do we actually analyse it? Do we That's put really it back point. out there? Mm. Do we push? Mm. Um, we're doing much more convening of organisations yeah, so that when we see somebody's doing a really great piece of work here and actually we can see a connection to another piece of work here we're saying to people come meet use our building uh, we'll provide the you know the cost to get here let's put some evaluation in across more than one of you and see what that's telling us about a field that you're operating in or a piece of work so we've done some really interesting work with Ministry of Stories and a number of other organisations around literacy projects. Mm -hmm. and we've got seven or eight projects that we're funding across the country and there's something about being more than the sum of their parts and then you start to think about how you resource that. Mm. And I think you're yeah. right, you know, we don't touch on the words like, does everyone need to have all of these departments? Does everyone need to have uh, all of the backroom facilities? Mm. Or is there some way in which that consolidation will start to happen? but in a way that maintains mission, absolutely, for organisation, allows them to divert resource into that mission, which is what we want to mm. see, um, and still deliver an effective service. It doesn't feel like it's over to me. It feels like it's yeah. really still in the process of playing out in all sorts of areas. I, would, I, mean, I think that's exactly right. I mean, I think, we, um, I think we're increasingly seeing ourselves as facilitators and conveners. Um, or, and creating spaces that we can then, w out of which come really interesting ideas that we can back. And we started doing these sort of meet Esme events around the country where we invite organisations that we fund and organisations that we don't fund. Um, um, and they will go across sector. So you have a really interesting dynamic of organisations all in the same town or in the same location who just don't speak to each other. And I am going to come back to the environment because, and food, because actually there is that connection about saying, or you know, all the social enterprise world, for, you know, for example. So, if the issue is actually how do people get to people can't afford to get to a museum or to, you know, uh, a place, you know, w w what's the connection with the community transport? Um, hub which will undoubtedly exist in that same location and where are those connections um you know here in um you know th there's a cultural park keeper um at the whitworth here wh which which we're funding which is all about using their land um, and that beautiful park to engage people with environmental issues and around food and growing so these these really interesting connections so we can sort of convene and facilitate some of those, as I said, unusual, um, unusual alliances, and then hopefully back some of the really interesting things that come out of there. But I do think thinking outside the box and making these unusual connections has got to be the way. And, and just to reiterate that, it's really about un underlying resilience of yep. organisations, isn't it? So if you, can, if you can connect to the youth sector in your town, mm -hmm. um, they're struggling as well. And, and rather than sitting and having different institutions struggling to reach the same bunch of people and to deliver a service to the, those people, it's about where could you come together and collaborate? Mm -hmm. What does that then give you as a museum yeah. in terms of audience, in terms of yeah. data and information about what matters to people? And what does it give the youth sector who are really, really under the cosh at the moment, perhaps mm -hmm. even more so than our sector is? Yeah, so it sounds like it, by baking in uh, uh, collaboration and partnership and by baking in things like an awareness of the environment and sustainability you will arrive at the sort of ideas that you guys are interested yeah. in because if you've come up with an idea that is relevant to the other organizations in your area it's 
probably a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and that was one of the things that we, again, spoke about before we came on stage. You guys said that you, you, it's about this balance between your individual goals as funders and um, museums' individual goals as organisations and finding somewhere in, in the middle mm. of that and that you can tell whenever they've essentially, like a museum essentially wants to do something that they're interested in. Yeah. You've sort of put in some of your keywords in the <laughs> hope that it will slip through your filters and that you can, you can sort of yeah, see that in my life. Definitely. Off. Please yeah. don't. <laughs> <laughs> and it, there is a sweet spot, I think, between yeah. the mission of the organisation and the objectives of the funder. And when those two things come together in the middle, you can, it, it sings, the application just comes alive. And when it doesn't, A, it, it's a waste of our time because mm -hmm. we have to read and assess every application. That's our commitment to the sector. But it's also a waste of your time because we read it and know that it's not fitting and then everyone's just spent a lot of time and effort doing something. And it's not very good for your resilience because if you're always chasing the project funding and trying to make it fit into something you don't actually believe in or vice versa, mm. then that's an unhealthy state to get into as well. Yeah. I think I would say, I think that's absolutely right. I would say in addition, you know, most of us as funders are also more in listening mode than we've ever been oh, before. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So although we do have our own objectives and our own strategies, and I hope clarity of thought, we're also more open to ourselves, to new ways mm. of thinking. And so I would say to people, you know, look at our funding streams but come to us if you've got other ideas as well because it mm. may just be yeah. that we can move further in that direction and much of our funding is completely open i mean they are called open programs for a reason so you can come to talk to us about anything yeah. so we're not telling you what it is that you should do but i would really really strongly endorse the point about please don't just bring your bottom drawer project that you've taken out of the bottom drawer you know 10 times and dusted it off and tried yeah. to fit it back into something it it's got to be one. it might it might be and one day it might have its moment <laughs> <laughs> but i think it's got to be something that you can really tell a story about what that project is going to do i mean i'm I think we as an we're really clear, you do all the hard work, we're just the funders. So, uh, you know, you're the ones that have to make this happen. And we're incredibly grateful for the hard work that all the sectors we work with do, but the museums do fantastic work. So it's trying to tell us how what you want to deliver fits both with your organisation's objectives, with the area in which you're working, with what's going on within that particular, and you know, if you're a specialist museum on this, you know, what are other museums on this doing in that particular area? How does it fit? I think we need context. We need to understand what it is that you're trying to get done. We need to understand how it transforms you or how it will transform the area in which you're working or transform people's understanding of the particular thing you're trying to talk about. But just making it, make sure it's a really compelling story. And I would come back to the point that I made at the beginning, really, which is the time that you spend thinking about all of those things at the beginning will more than pay in dividends as you go through it, because all of us will, will be able to tell you've really thought it through. Um, John Mulligan, who is our director, the most brilliant director of funding, um, gives two tips for people when they're applying. He says, first of all, don't start with the need, because... If we get 3,000 applications a year, we fund 350. And the number of them that's, that start with, we are in, you know, number 15 on the index of multiple deprivation, number 17, number 12, number 22. It, it, that doesn't, we know that, we, like, we know the need. Um, so he says, start with something that actually sings to say, I was speaking with Charlie yesterday one of our young people and he said x so you're immediately connecting right down to the people so you're, the, the the voice of the people that you're engaging with just comes through straight away and the second thing he says is get your grandma to read it because if your grandma doesn't understand it <laughs> then you know we you know the, the point it has got to resonate now mm. with 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 yeah. real genuine people and communities and, and and so get your grandma to read it and if she doesn't understand what you're doing then chances are a lot of other people won't be won't won't, won't i don't either. think my mum understands what i do for a living <laughs> oh. <laughs> no, okay, maybe not your grandma maybe your uncle or whatever anyway there's a, there's, a, there's a possibly apocryphal story of a bbc a very senior bbc commissioner who used to just run all the pictures past his mum yeah. yeah. Oh. And like that's how he... And actually, I hadn't thought about this beforehand, so I'm going to make a pitch. Um, <laughs> so which, which is that actually, like, you know, I, I was in-house at museums and press offices and no one ever really came and spoke to me about 
this kind of stuff. But like my job every day was to try and get some kind of disinterested journalist yeah. to be interested in, in the museum that I was working in and who didn't, you know, had I know a lot of the things that you're talking about, this thing of like personal stories and, you know, we work with this one young person and they loved it. Like that's such a way in, that's so exciting. And I'm always really surprised. Like I understand why in the language of bids and the process, you know, everyone kind of defaults to the kind of neutral language that they've been taught to do it in. Mm. But you do have to sort of, from the bat, you know, start off differently and maybe stop talking to different people in your organisation, people who do more, uh, you know, who are spend most of the time talking to people yeah. that don't also work Definitely. at the museum um, might, be, might be useful. This might be a really contentious thing to say, do but it. um, uh, it's why if you're employing fundraisers to write your bid, it needs to come back in-house before yeah, it comes definitely. to us. Mm. So um, yeah. it, it's, it's a very peculiar thing, but when we see applications that have been written by fundraisers, no matter how good they are, and there'll be some in the room, which is why it's slightly contentious, <laughs> but they just don't give you a sense of what the organisation is about. There's something missing about flavour and values. Yeah. Of heart. That just need you, I, I'm happy for someone to do all of the, the work, yeah. mm. but it needs to come back in house to be looked at really carefully by the by people British. who are actually doing it and British. delivering Absolutely. it and talking to people on the ground and they can make an enormous difference. The other thing I would just say is just to be really careful about all of this is that we, um, we're in the middle of a grantee perception survey. So we do take feedback directly from the people that we're working, that we're funding as well. Yeah. And I think that's really important in this whole conversation about we set our objectives and we're really firm about those. Actually, we, we do that, but we do continually ask people out there, mm. um, have we got it right? And are, we, mm. is our, are our values and fitting other behaviours? Actually, are the funds the right funds? Is something happening in your world that we should be aware of? And that's all, that all genuinely is anonymised. So mm -hmm. it, we've just closed the survey and we'll know in January kind of how we're doing and we can adjust accordingly. You're getting evaluated. We are. <laughs> the room will be enjoying that. And we, actually, we're... actually, we, we, did it for, we did it for everybody we turned down. Um, yeah, we did that And that too. was really, um, and that was anonymised as well. Mm. That was very heartwarming. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which exactly the same. Actually, it was, actually yeah. it was brutal. It was brutal and it was good brutal actually because mm -hmm. it does make you have to kind of yeah. take a little bit of a mm. step back and uh, well a big step back actually and yeah. say so we're yeah, doing exactly the same. I think the other thing that we've come across is the mythology. I mean we've been going for 25 years now so not surprisingly during that time there's, there's been a huge mythology of what you have to do to get an HLF grant. <laughs> And we sat in a room with, with a bunch of people who'd applied for us, those who'd been successful, those who'd yeah. not been successful. And I think the team on the whole were just slightly speechless by the end of this <laughs> it's experience. Weird perception. Because we just didn't know where, some of them you did know where they come from. It was a piece of policy that we might have had 15 years ago that yeah. somebody somewhere has got logged in their brain and it's yeah. just carried on being passed from one person to another. But some of them we just had no idea where they'd come from. So increasingly we're trying to sort of say to people, you know, please don't rely on, I think, you know, yeah. people who say I mean, this. Good, get your questions ready, we're going to questions yeah. soon. Just I was just, no, I was just going to say, I think it's a good reminder to us that we have the responsibility to communicate yes, very clearly absolutely. about what we're doing, absolutely. how we're changing. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not that, you know, the people out there, it's not their fault if they, uh, you know, associate us with something that we've moved on from. Yeah, and I think sometimes it's a little bit like a... Uh you know, little kids in a playground, like in an information vacuum, strange rumours. Yes. Take yes. on, like, <laughs> yeah. never, yeah. never submit your application on a Tuesday. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely, yeah. they're always grumpy on a Friday. Yeah. Never do it, yeah. When I mean, people aren't sure, when I mean, people really want uh, something and they don't know how to get it, you know, it's bizarre. Yeah. Uh, well, I spent the last 10 years, over. before I took this job, I spent 10 years of my life doing what most people's rooms was applying to HLF for funding. So Put I absolutely knew and believe some of those bits I <laughs> <laughs> so it was actually really interesting to come inside and hear that I got it wrong all that time. You should do like a top ten myths page yeah. on your Myth website. Yeah, we should. We oh, should. actually, I tell you what needs that, which I would put, is the social investment world. God, does that need a myth buster? Mm. Yeah. Does that need a sort of a complete? You know, because we do quite a lot of it. We do quite a lot of it in the arts, um, and um, we, you know, we help organisations leverage their assets through loans. Um, we, we we have some really interesting facilities, you know, for um, um, for productions in the theatre. We we part of the Arts Impact Fund, and it's really surprising to me how much again how these myths and misconceptions about what social investment is and what it can mm. what it can and can't be used for and actually how quite easy it is if it's done really well yeah 
Anyway, awesome. Questions? There's, oh, the, I should have said, there are microphones at the front, one in each aisle. So go and stand at a microphone. Cue in an orderly fashion. Behind, <laughs> behind the Don't all rush at once. Um, um, and yeah, no. come up to the front. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. I thought that quite was only the for front. the important lady. It's more like a town hall atmosphere, <laughs> I think, is what Google would call it. Brilliant. Look, two questions. This is amazing. <laughs> You first, sir. You've, you've obviously all got um, different application processes. You've got different um, objectives. There may well be an answer to this, but um, is there time for a kind of universal impact kind of charter mark that organisations have, um, which kind of helps build their capacity and their kind of their standing as a translator for you? Because I think the biggest question is to you really is obviously. What must keep you awake at night is, are you actually making a difference? Yeah. And I think yeah. certainly how we measure that is one of the things we've been talking about. Do we all understand what we mean by impact? And if I measure it, is it the same as any of the other organisations that measure it? So I think there is a huge amount that we can do to look at whether we're doing... But I think part of the problem is that people are set up by different, you know, from different backgrounds, so they have different targets. I mean. I, well, you see, I, I'd go even... I'd be way more mad, ra radical than that, and I was completely new to the grant-making world four years ago, and, frankly, I still don't really understand it. I still think it's a bit of an odd system, but we try and make it as good as we can. But one of the things that has always occurred to me that it's not our impact, so we shouldn't be measuring it, and we shouldn't be asking... Each of us shouldn't be asking for measurement around impact, and actually it's the organisation's impact that we should be caring about and the impact. So it would just seem to me that actually organisation, and also we almost act like proxy boards sometimes, which I think mm. find a bit odd, that we ask for information that over and above what you would send to your board sometimes, which again I find odd. So surely, surely the system should be that you as organisations produce your impact reports once a year, to your boards about what you do, how you do it, and we should all take that as as the reporting and make a judgment on that. Um, and I and it's a bit like if if um, a public um, a public company had to produce an annual report for each of its investors. I mean, it would never do that. It produces one report that all the investors look at and go, oh, that's interesting, that's what but they've done. But you do have to produce an annual report on a consistent basis. If you're, if you're financially reporting, there's really, really strict guidelines. But the financial stuff... So you not... can compare one to the other. And I guess that's the challenge for us, well, isn't no, but it? You have rating, well, actually, but you have rating organisations that rate things, rate other aspects of mm. credit or whatever. So, yeah. But it just seems to me mm. that we've got this completely the wrong way around and that it's us measuring impact, which is not our impact. And anyway, maybe I'm just being I a mean, bit simple think, about it, but I would just flip it completely the other way around. I think, you know, you have to be honest as a, as a funder. We all, we, we like to think we're very objective and actually we really do try to be objective and we have <laughs> trustees, at least in the case of the art fund, who really do try to suppress their own views at some level. Yes. But in the end, funding is subjective and so, Going back to, you know, what makes a great application, it's, you know, that sign of spark and originality and difference that is most likely to attract funding. And I, I would resist a world in which we're trying to reduce everything to a, a kind of system of, of, of evaluation and, and marking mm. and so on. I, I think, mm. you know, we're in, encouraging a, um, a, a dynamic relationship between funder and funded organisations, and the nature of that relationship will will change in time. So I would be all for you know, individuality rather than a kind of uniform system, really. And it sounds as well like you want people to be a bit more honest about when things have yeah, gone wrong. Definitely. Because those reports that you... I mean, I've, I've helped, you know, polish the language on those reports in various places, yeah. and, like, it does become a relentlessly positive document. <laughs> um, and, and, so, and so maybe it's quite important for you guys to say, like, you don't have to make out that, like, everything you do is a total success all the time. Like, and having an awareness of yeah. things that have gone wrong and how you can learn from them, it, that, that would be different. That would make you so, go, oh, actually. Yeah. So again, it, it partly goes back to what's the intention behind the funding as well. Mm. And if you move the, if the funding intention away from the intention is to get 345 people to do X and say the yep. intention of the funding is to explore whether this way of working reaches people, then the way that you report back tends to be slightly different. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and I hope that what we're talking about is conversations with us to say this is what we're learning and this is, how, this is what we want to share with you and then this yeah. is what we're doing in our own organisation and we're happy for you to use that information out more widely. One of our colleagues, Sarah Llewellyn, who runs mm. Barrow Cadbury, mm. talks a lot about contribution, not, not attribution. attribution. Yeah. And I think that's language which is working within our sector more as foundations to, to yeah. say yeah it's we're not we, we don't do that I, my annual report no longer says um we funded forty-five thousand people to do this no. and twenty-five thousand people to do that because it's a completely meaningless piece yeah. of information mm -hmm. for the it's world quite noise. um and what we're saying we've just published a, f a look back over a year is within the work that we've funded these are the things that we're beginning to see this is what we're paying attention to this is what the sector's telling us and this is information which we think you might find useful out there again and i think we have to separate the the, the issue of applicant you know, applications for funding from reporting and relationship management yeah. they're very different things so applications for, for funding for sure have got to be individualistic and sparky because that's your your pitch, I suppose. When we have a relationship with you, we now look, we now at the end of a, a, a relationship or a grant, we have a learning conversation with every organisation. And it's a conversation where we go through three things, our performance, your outcomes, did we get it right? And how are, how are organisations faring? And we then collect that information and we're beginning to publish that out. Um, but it's a learning conversation, and if things have gone wrong, then that's okay. Um, but that, I think, is separate from your impact reports, which I think should be about your organisation and what you do, because it is your impact, it's not ours. And what we're doing is that relationship mm. and conversation. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a marriage between those two things that can work really well. The other thing is for the two of us, we're funding, I think for you two maybe to a certain extent, but we're, we're funding more and more core funding within, yeah, we are. with our yeah. funding. So yeah, it gets harder and harder yeah. to say, let's have a universal impact measure <coughs> because um, not all of our funding is kind of stuck onto a project. No. And so it's, we're not looking just at what the project's doing, we're looking at the whole organisation, but we can't claim the whole organisation's impact. So I think it's an ongoing conversation, but I think what you're hearing actually is it's unlikely we're going to get to a universal yes. stamp <laughs> anytime soon. Okay, thanks. Uh, I had a question which was about the timescales for funding and the good old sustainability issue, um, and, and partly come from a born of frustration. At you may be three years in and you feel like you're actually just getting started at three years and you're building the relationships. And what I was interested in, in the States, I've noticed more and more people are actually thinking about funding generationally. And mm. I wondered, I've got... I just wonder whether you'd ever get to a point where actually maybe you're investing and it's for 18 years and it's the impact on a child um, and by the time they're an adult. I, I'm just interested in whether that's ever anything you'd consider. Uh, we moved, so I think we, we are, new strategy was launched in 2015 and we moved to four year funding. Um, which coincided with me coming out of the Arts Council and wanting to move beyond political cycles. Yeah. So I thought that was really important to get the stretch going. And actually we're having a very active conversation with trustees. We have a board meeting in two weeks' time to talk about longer term funding than that. Um, uh, some of us went to the States to do a kind of a learning trip there and to find out how foundations were operating. And it goes partly to Caroline's point about different funding mechanisms as well. Yeah. Um, beginning to look at things like endowments and whether uh, that's a useful model, longer term funding, and whether that's a useful model. Um, capital as well and rethinking just that conversation amongst us all about if you can take revenue cost out of an organization really long term is that a useful thing to do at, in certain organization cycles so i think there's a lot of creativity in the funders world mm. thinking about some of those things um, i think we're definitely all thinking that why th i mean why three years I don't know. No, no, I, that was one of the questions I asked when I first came in. Why three years? Oh, we go, we go for posterity at the Art Fund. Right. <laughs> but, but yeah, but what does? But what? Yeah. So what does good? But I think. Mm. But the assumption. I don't. I don't think organisations can make the assumption that because they have been funded. So we may take start thinking about a ten to fifteen year view, but that won't necessarily mean we'll fund the same organisations over that ten to fifteen mm. years. But we are definitely talking about taking a much more longer term view. 50% of our funding, so 70% of our funding is core funding and 50% of our funding is continuation funding. Mm. So we're beginning to ask some really 
the questions about, well, if we kind of know we're going to fund this organisation for the longer term, why are we making them come back every three years? That's, that's, so for the continuation bit, I think we're kind of really beginning mm -hmm. to think a bit more creatively about that. Um, for the 50%, which is new funding, again, I think we are beginning to think that five years is probably a better, three to five years is probably a better, better number. I think we're probably slightly different to the rest because we're actually set up by statute as a time limited funder. So it actually says that we, mm. we give time limited funding. So effectively that's project funding. I have to say some of our projects do take, I don't know, they're quite made 18 years yet. <laughs> I mean, some of them feel like they're going that way. Um, but that's not the intention when they start. So uh, yeah. <laughs> I think for us, it's keeping something within a manageable time frame that we feel an organisation can commit to and that it can keep memory about what they committed to during the time span of delivering it. So, uh, you know, it does, it does tend to mean that what you're looking at is something that was in a sort of three to five year range. You know, it's not all positive because if we tie up our money yeah, in those yeah, longer term yeah. relationships and there's less money, money for the new <laughs> stuff coming yeah. through, um, and uh, we had a really interesting conversation in America with Open Societies Foundation about the need for a thick layer of what they call civil society, quite mm. small grants turning quite quickly, and then these longer term structural yeah. grants over the mm. top. And that's an interesting balance because although we're substantial funders, we're actually not enormous funders. Yeah. And the American foundations have significantly more to draw on than we do. So the, it's always going to be a balance, but I think it's moving in that direction. Lovely. Well, I think we are at time. Oh. Um, so thank, thank you, everybody. Thank you to the Fantastic Panel. I hope it was useful. And, um, you know, buttonhole them after. I mean, they have to leave out those two doors. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Thank you. Right, thanks. Thank you.